Well, good morning, church family. It is Monday, June the 1st, and we're continuing our study of the New City Catechism. We are actually going to uh, move to doing only one of these a week, so they will be on Mondays at 9 a.m. from now on. Uh, we are a little over halfway through our uh, 52 questions, so we'll continue at that pace of one per week. So I hope you guys will continue studying with us. We are tackling question number 28 this morning, which is, what happens after death to those not united to Christ by faith? The adult answer is, at the day of judgment, they will receive the fearful but just sentence of condemnation pronounced against them. They will be cast out from the favorable presence of God into hell to be justly and grievously punished forever. The children's answer is, which is a little shorter, is they will be cast out from the presence of God into hell to be justly punished forever. Our key text is John three sixteen through 18 and verse, verse 36, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Then verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The concept of hell is likely the most sobering and terrifying doctrine in all of Scripture. Um, But as terrifying as it may be, it's important that we realize that it is indeed uh, taught throughout the Bible, throughout Scripture. Uh, In fact, Jesus himself had very much to say about hell. He talked about the idea, the reality of hell uh, quite frequently, in fact. In, In Matthew 13, 41 through 42, Jesus said, "...the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace." In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is not a teaching that we could come up with ourselves or that we would come up with ourselves. And it's not a a concept or a doctrine that we would believe if it was not clearly taught in Scripture. And because it's so clearly taught throughout throughout the Bible, we as believers, uh, we must not shy away from this terrifying reality because to do so is to actually challenge the character of God and it would mean changing the gospel by which we are saved. You know, there's actually a growing group uh, of professing believers today who have sought to erase the idea of hell and to suggest uh, a concept we call universalism, which says that essentially uh, when Jesus died on the cross, from that moment on, everyone was saved and no one uh, suffers in hell. But this belief is not at all grounded in Scripture. Uh, instead, it comes from the pushback that we hear many times, many times from people who, who would ask the question, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? And so this idea of universalism is typically just because of the pushback of a question like that. But when we hear that question many times, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? We fail to ask the equally valid question many times, which would be, how could a just God allow a sinner into heaven. You see, here's the the idea. Love does not trump justice. In fact, genuine love necessitates justice. Let me illustrate that by drawing our attention to what we're probably all currently very aware of, and that's the situation uh, and the tragic situation of the death of George Floyd, who, as we know, was unjustly murdered at the hands of a police officer. And we see in our society, and rightfully so, a cry for justice. We see an unjust situation, and we see the response of really all of our nation, and and really this goes across the world, of this call to justice, this cry for justice to be uh, exercised in this situation. In fact, if justice was not carried out, we would say that that is evil, that that is unjust. Um, And as we think about that, of course, we would say, look, the the reaction of many to try to combat uh, injustice with more injustice in uh, destroying property and stealing and injuring and even taking the life of someone else is not justice either. And we should call out against that as well. 
But as I mentioned, the reality is whether the officer who uh, committed this unjust act of killing George Floyd, whether or not he receives justice in an earthly sense, we realize biblically that he will ultimately receive the just condemnation that he deserves unless he is to turn from his sin and to trust Jesus by faith, Jesus' death and resurrection to save him. Now that doesn't mean that we should neglect justice this side of eternity. It doesn't mean that we should say, well, okay, he got off, not a big deal because God's going to deal with him. Actually, to the contrary, we should seek justice because uh, as believers, our God and the true God is just and he desires us to practice justice. But regardless of what happens this side of eternity, we know that ultimately justice will be served, that God is a just God and he will reap the just uh, sentence of his unjust actions. And we recognize in this situation that love and justice work hand in hand because the loving thing to do in this situation with George, George Floyd is for justice to be served because if justice is bypassed, it would be unloving. It would be unloving to the family of George Floyd, to his friends, to those who are crying out for justice around our nation and around the world. You see, love and justice go hand in hand. And we don't have a problem with justice when it comes to others that we deem as evil and deserving of justice. Um, we don't have a problem with the idea of hell when it comes to someone like Hitler, right? We think of the evil actions of a man like Adolf Hitler and we actually would say, look, hell seems to be the just reward of someone like that. But when it comes to us, and when it comes to the reality that we deserve the justice of God, and we deserve the just condemnation of our evil actions and our sin, because we offended a holy God, it's then that we suddenly have a problem with justice. That's because as fallen believers, our sense of justice is skewed, right? We don't look at things in a, in a just lens as our just God does, who is holy, who is apart from sin. Instead, because of our sin, we typically compare ourselves with others, uh, and we think we're not as bad as other people, and so we don't deserve the justice that many others may because of their sin. But in reality, because we have broken the law of a holy God, we stand condemned, uh, rightly deserving to bear God's wrath for all of, all of eternity. Uh, sometimes we think the idea of eternal torment seems too severe, and we've covered this in a previous New City Catechism video. The idea is that we've offended a holy God, and because he's eternal, because he is as high above us as anything, there's an infinite gap between us as his finite creation and him as the infinite creator. Uh, because we've offended him, we deserve eternal torment because he's an eternal cre creature that we have offended. And so we deserve the justice of God, each and every one of us, because every one of us has broken God's law, the Ten Commandments specifically. We've all lied. We've all had hatred in our heart. We've all lusted and committed adultery in our heart, and we could go on and on and on. All of us stand in a place of condemnation, deserving the just wrath of God upon ourselves for eternity. And anything less than that eternal punishment would be unjust. If God were to turn a blind eye to uh, our sin, that would be unjust, and he would not be a just God. And so because he is holy and because he is just and righteous, justice must be served. But here's the beautiful reality of the gospel, which does not compromise the justice, and it does not compromise the love of God. And it goes back to the verses we, we began with in John chapter 3. God has made a way to not compromise his justice, but to also provide mercy and to provide grace through his compassion, through his love. As we saw, God so loved the world that he made a way for his justice to be satisfied and for sinners to be saved from his wrath. And that way was made by God sending his son Jesus, God in human form, to step in and to pay the eternal penalty that we deserve by bearing God's wrath against our sin on the cross. Jesus was God in human form who lived a perfect life, who kept God's law perfectly, and yet he who knew no sin, as the Bible says, became sin for us. And on the cross, the eternal 
weight of God's wrath was poured out upon the sinless Son of God in our place. He bore the sin and the penalty of our sin uh, that we deserve. He bore that on the cross. And of course, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, which demonstrated that he was indeed who he said he was, that he was God, and that his sacrifice was acceptable before the Father. And while all of us stand condemned because of our sin, all of us deserve the justice of God, Jesus has now made a way for anyone to be justified or declared righteous by faith in his finished work. Not faith in our good works, not trying to make up for our wrongdoing, but trusting that he has paid in full the penalty of our sin. He has borne the wrath of God, which is the just uh, condemnation that we deserve. He has borne that on the cross. And when we will when we turn from our sin and we realize that we've offended a holy God and because we are sinners, because we are lawbreakers, we justly deserve eternal condemnation in hell. When we turn from that sin and trust in the finished work of Christ in dying in our place and rising again from the dead, that those verses we read tell us that we will be saved from the wrath of God. We, God did not come and Jesus did not come to condemn us that's because we already stood condemned. All of us by uh, human nature stand in a place of condemnation, deserving the just wrath of God for eternity. And yet God has lovingly and graciously made a way not to compromise his justice, but in a way that justice is served and yet mercy is extended. So my challenge to us today, if you're a believer, recognize that it's nothing that you have done that has made you right before God. It's solely because of the grace and mercy of God because Jesus bore the punishment you deserve. And if you're watching this and you don't know Christ as Savior, realize that the day is coming when you will stand in judgment before a holy God. And nothing you can offer, nothing that you can do in and of yourself can cause him to turn a blind eye, to practice injustice, to dismiss your case. Nothing can be done in your in your own efforts to cause ju to cause God to uh, compromise His justice. Instead, realize that your penalty has been paid, and God has uh, done justly what what He needed to do to satisfy that justice. But He's also made a way to provide mercy and grace. If you'll turn from your sin and trust Jesus by faith, you can escape the wrath to come, and you can realize the justice of God that was poured out upon Jesus in your place. Our model prayer as we close says this, Judge of all the earth, we tremble to think of the judgment that awaits all outside your covenant. Before it is too late, may those we love be reconciled to you so that, so that they do not suffer the punishment that is theirs and would have been ours apart from you. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you today that you are a just God, that we don't have to um, go through life um, and, and see evil around us and know that there is no justice coming. But we know that in your holiness and your righteousness, you will serve uh, justice ultimately. And Father, we thank you that in that same sense, Lord, we stand deserving um, the just penalty of our sin. And yet in your grace and in your mercy, you have made a way for us to be saved from the wrath to come. You have made a way for us to be saved from this terrifying reality of hell. And so we just thank you for those of us who put our faith in you, um, that have heard the good news of the gospel. We thank you for uh, the saving faith that you have uh, worked in us and that we, we have come to know you. Um, Lord, I pray if anyone's watching this today, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, um, just speak to their heart, uh, convict them of their sin, show them that they stand condemned apart from Christ. And may they, in that state, not stay there, but may they turn from their sin and trust Jesus' finished work and his death and resurrection. May they trust it on their behalf and experience justice satisfied, but mercy and grace extended as well. And Father, I pray for those of us as believers, that this reality of hell uh, and, and the reality that we, uh, we will not have to suffer in hell, may that not cause us to be complacent, but Father, instead, may we go out to those who stand condemned and share the good news of the gospel. May we be faithful 
in, in calling sinners away from uh, the wrath that is to come apart from you. And Father, as we do that, may, may you give us grace and may you give us mercy and work in our midst. And we'll give you all the praise as you work in us and through us for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed our study today. We'll pick back up with question number 29 next Monday at 9 a.m. So I hope you guys have a blessed week, and we will see you next time.